Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. If you've ever run into a bit of hype, you would have had an instant reaction. It would have instantly violated you, like, you know, physically, you would have felt, this is terrible. But at some point in time, we also start to think, does hype really help conversion? And can we use hype to our advantage? Hold that thought for a second, because that's exactly what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover hype versus no hype. Which one gets greater conversion? And we're going to cover these three topics. The first one being the power of hype. The second is how hype works with sales. And the third is using disinformation strategies to create good results, not evil. And we'll start out with the first one, which is the power of hype. A photograph at the best of times is a white lie. When you compose a photo, there's stuff to the left of the photo that's not so great, and to the right it might be all trashy, but as a photographer, you ignore the elements to the left, to the right, and you only click what you want. In that sense, let's just agree that we're all similar when it comes to hype. We all subscribe to telling slightly tweaked stories. We take photos that make our vacations look better, and somehow we'll make our work and our lives seem a little more glorious than it really is. But how does this hype play out when it comes to marketing and writing sales copy? And we have four possibilities here. Possibility one is lots of hype gets results. Possibility two is lots of hype, but low or no results. And then no hype and you get results. And the fourth one is no hype and no results. Now you may not like hype, but what if you were asked which of the two are more likely to get results? And your answer might be possibility one and possibility two, which is you use hype and you get great results or you use hype, but you get no results. But at least what you're trying to do is you're using hype and you're hoping that you will get results. So let me tell you a story here. I have an issue with one of my good friends. The moment you get to his site, you get a big pop-up. And when I say big, I mean really big. It covers the entire screen in red. And then it invites you to get his report and to subscribe to his email. But what is the promise? A hundred thousand readers in 18 months. I'm not kidding. That's the promise. It then uses conditional language that no one cares much about. It says, 100k readers in 18 months? Yes, it's possible. Learn how in my free guide. And then it prompts you to enter your email address and to download the file. You also get the chance to swipe away the pop-up, but is it hype? I most certainly think so. Let's say you landed on the site. Would you fill in the form? Would you be curious enough to fill that form and say, well, let me see what's in this? And if we are curious enough, yes, the answer is, I'll do it. And this is why the pop-up continues to fill the screen of every new visitor to the site. And though he's my friend, I would still put him in the hype box because it is practically impossible to get to that level in 18 months. And let's say you download the guide and you read it. It doesn't give you a step-by-step -step process. It doesn't give you any precise steps at all. All you have is an overview of what you need to do, approximately, somewhat. In effect, it's hype and it has no results. But there's also hype with results, which kind of contradicts itself, because if there are results and there are precise results, then it isn't hype, right? But 
but the language is flowery. It's over the top. It promises and it seems like it's delivering the result, but by and large, this category of high plus results isn't common. A person or organization that tends to get results consistently rarely has to conform to hype. And sometimes those results are written in a way that makes it hard to understand. And that's what makes it hype. So let's say you joined an online course and that person who was selling the course said that the course has a 90% completion rate. Does that sound impressive to you? Of course it does, because for one, you don't see yourself in the 10% that isn't finishing the course. Most of us automatically slide into that 90%, even though we might not have to have a record of finishing everything. And this is where the hype creeps in. It's not overt, it's covert. Because notice, they're not giving you a 90% skill rate. They're saying a 90% completion rate. Well, you went to school, didn't you? 90% of the students finished school. Did that make them brilliant or smart or give them any advantage in life? No, of course not. But that's how the hype can be put in. It can be put in this language which makes you feel like something is happening. 90% completion rate. But what you want is a 90% skill rate. Now that is something that you need to see. That is something that you need to have, but no. You get this little subtle hype that you don't notice at first. You only realize later that finishing something and having a skill are two vastly different things. There may also be a chance that the tasks that they allow you to complete are so simple that most people could get to the other end without any problem. And that is hype. That's a good bit of sneaky behavior, but it's just hype after all. So we had these four possibilities. First was the hype with results and then hype and you still get no results. And then you have no hype and you get results and you have no hype and you get no results. So that's the bad news. The bad news is that hype is far more successful than non-hype. But there is good news too. And the good news is that this forces you, the non-hypester, the person who is not willing to do that hype, who's not willing to say you're going to get 100,000 subscribers in 18 months, or not willing to say that you can make $30 million or not willing to say that, look, our clients have grown their business by 30% or 50%. You are that kind of person. So what are you going to do? Because everyone else seems to be using the hype bandwagon. Well, lots of people are. And the answer is very simple. You need to get a result. You don't need to get every possible result under the sun. You need to get a result. Let me tell you how this is done. Let's say you're teaching headlines. Headlines, you could look at it from 20, 30 different ways. There are so many ways to write a headline. Testimonial in the headlines, how to format headlines. But the trick is not to get into every possible way because what you're seeking is a result. And if I were to say, look, put the end or the even, and you get a much better headline. So how to stalk a dinosaur and never get hurt. So that advances the conversation. How to stalk a dinosaur even if you're really tired. Both of these are really good headlines because they have a how and then they have an end and they have an even. Now what you've got is a result and there was no hype at all. When you go and you teach a client this and they go, wow, I didn't know that you could write a headline so quickly. I thought it was very complicated. I thought I had to test A versus B. I had to do all this stuff. What you've really done is you've achieved it without the hype. When you look at all that hype out there, it is quite normal to think I couldn't do that, but I wish I could do that. I wish I could just suspend my own, I don't know, this stuff that holds me back from doing this. 
hype. I wish I could do that, but you can't do that. So the only option you and I have is to get a specific result. Not results, but result. And when you take whatever topic you're dealing with, whether it's dog training or it's boxing or it's whatever, get one result. I'll give you one more example and then we'll get out of here. When I was learning how to play badminton, I hired a coach. And what he did was he taught me how to smash. Smash the shuttlecock so that the opponent couldn't recover from it. And we spent ages just learning that smash. But I was winning games after that. I got a result. I got one result. Was everything in my game much better? No. But I sure could smash. And this is the whole point. The point is that you can often hinge your report on one result. You can hinge your product on one result. And then, of course, you can add the second one and the third one. This is how we build our courses. This is how we build our workshops. This is how we build the books. When you read the brain audit, for instance, you get to a result and you go, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And then you read the second part and you get a result. And this is the way you can go about it without the hype. You don't have to do the hype like everybody else. Just one result and you'll find that your client gets hooked onto that and comes back for more. That's it. And that brings us to the end of the first part. Let's look at the second part, which is how hype works with sales. Do you know the difference between fake news and disinformation? I thought they were remarkably similar, but I found out that there was a huge difference and it's all nicely linked to hype. So when you think of fake news, it's exactly what it seems to be. When the news is not real, it's fake. If someone says Earth has two moons, well, it's hard to consider that person as being sane. And so you say, well, you're a loony, let's move along. But disinformation, that's far more ingenious. It works on our system of belief. It creates havoc with our thinking. But first we have to deal with the beliefs. By and large, if someone tells us something and it sounds plausible, we believe them. And then if they add a second fact, we believe them again. And the third fact, we believe them again. Fourth fact, again, true, you believe them. And then they do something very insidious. They create disinformation. So let's take an example. Let's say that you believe that Earth has one moon. Let's say you know that the moon has a lot of craters. And finally, let's say that you know there's an area on the moon that was named as the Sea of Tranquility. Now let's say that someone told you that a probe found unique forms of bacteria in the Sea of Tranquility and that they're trying to get that bacteria back to Earth and examine it. But because of the risks, they have to isolate the bacteria, they have to monitor it, and they have to do this under extremely rigid conditions. Notice that the first three elements were facts. There is a moon, it has craters, there is the sea of tranquility, but the bacteria bit, that's completely fake. And that's how disinformation works. It doesn't worry about the fake stuff. It digs deep into what you consider to be true. And then it takes another true point and puts it there, and then the third true point, and then finally it puts this fake point. And when you have three points or four points side by side, and then you sneak in the other one, then you automatically assume, provided that it's not too crazy, you assume that, well, all of them, all of it must be true. With sales letters, this kind of disinformation is easier to manipulate because people are already in this slightly heated up state. They want to buy something. And when people are hurried to do something, they tend to do something very interesting. They jumble up their facts. If they find that some of the elements are true, they expect and they accept that everything else will be true as well. So when a website tells you that they have predicted the market for 25 years in a row, that shouldn't be accurate. Anyone that 
accurately predicts the market for 25 years in a row, doesn't have to sell you anything. All they have to do is take their money, put it in the share market, and they can sail away in their $100 million yacht. And if they were to start with that comment, with that point, then you might not believe them. So what they have to do is now align your system. They have to put those three things, those four things in advance, and that's what they'll do. That's how disinformation works. So you go and put in one fact and second fact and third fact and fourth fact, and then you sneak in the 25 years. And now it's much easier for you to believe that if three or four things are true, then the fifth must also be true. And the funny thing is that hype doesn't have to be buried in the middle of the sales page. A headline, the first paragraph, that alone can convince a client. A short video can do the same. And that's because the client has usually thought about the concept long before they've got into the sales page. So they've already seen something, they've already been thinking about investing, they aren't sure what to do. And when that sales page pops up, then they're already primed to believe some of the elements. And it's relatively easier to move their client to the buy now button. If the risk is low, hype is easy to roll out. If all you're doing is asking for an email address, people might give it to you because they feel that the payoff might be worth it but it's still very much hype. And when you realize the power of disinformation, it's scary because now you know the formula that causes disinformation to work and you can use it too. And it's your choice, whether to use it or to walk away. The funny thing is that no matter what you look at on this planet, you can use it for good or for evil. Let's find out in the third part, how to take this disinformation this seeming piece of hype and then use it for good, for the good of the client. For the longest time, I've been trying to get people to understand that talent isn't inborn. But people always say, wait a second, you're talking to me as a cartoonist. I can't draw a straight line when it comes to drawing. And then I'd launch into like a two-hour presentation, trying to convince them that it works, that talent is not a result of your genes, but rather of how, and I'll go into this two-hour presentation. And they may be convinced, but it still takes two hours. So how do we use disinformation and this hype to do this little mental judo? Let me give you an example. Recently, maybe a few months ago, I ran into an article that says only 5% of talent comes from external sources, such as teachers and training. And the rest of it, the 95%, is a mixture of genes and other stuff. We have a real problem at this point, don't we? If someone were to believe that they are 95% doomed, how can we fix this problem of talent? And disinformation works on the principle of a few honest facts, and the balance of it is fake stuff. So it's a lot like a virus. Now, a virus works on a lock and key system. When the key fits a lock, a cell is allowed the virus to enter your body. And when that happens, the virus is through. Let's assume for a second, this isn't a harmful virus, but one that helps you improve your skills. To get through the client, we have to present a few actual facts. You know how we did it the last time? One, two, three, actual facts, and then follow it up with more accurate facts. So here's what was written in the article. The first fact, when 6,000 pairs of twins were analyzed, it was found that genes played an impressive role in school achievement. That's fact number one. Fact number two, in twins, it was found that 70% of stability and achievement comes from genes and 25% of it from a shared environment, such as growing up in the same space, with the same family, in the same school. And fact three was that this article, which was on the BBC, suggests that only 5% of your talent is from external forces, such as different friends and different teachers. 
And that's what I did. I did this presentation in Australia and I presented them with these facts. And I said, do you believe that only 5% of your talent comes from everything that you've done so far? The 95% of everything that you do, whether it's Photoshop or podcasting or anything, comes from your genes or from shared environments or whatever. And of course, the audience is going, no. And I go, let's do this. Let's assume that only 5% of your whole system works that way, that you're going to get talent from only 5%. What if we only took that 5% and in the next 20 minutes, we were able to get going on at least three skills and skills like maths and cooking and drawing. And let's start with drawing. So you see what's happening there? What we did was we took all of those facts and we turned it around. We took all of those, well, I don't consider them to be facts, but let's assume that they were facts. And suddenly the audience is disbelieving the facts and you're able to slip in the thing that you want, which is you want them to understand that talent is a matter of something else. And I won't go into that presentation now, but it's a matter of something else. And then you demonstrate that something else because what happens at the end of 20 minutes is that everyone in the room ends up drawing very well. We have a before and after so they can see for themselves. And everyone understands how quickly they can cook an Indian dish without a recipe. And everyone can say multiply by 11 times 25 or 11 times 44, things like that. What happens is the whole mood in the room shifts. You're able to get the message across. And now you have created a level where people are getting results. They're getting confident and they're getting results and they want more of it. And you've done it using that nonsense hype, that those facts that weren't true in the first place, or at least that I personally didn't believe to be true. And the way to do it was to present it as, as if that were the truth. And then to slip your bit in and go from the other side. It's a bit of judo, isn't it? So yes, you and I, we don't want to do this hype thing. But let's assume that there is hype out there. Let's assume that hype is counterproductive to you at this point in time. Well... You can play virus. You can have that lock and key system. You can find out those three things that seemingly are true to your audience and then tweak the last one and use that last one to make sure that clients say, wait a second, if I can do so much with so little, then it's amazing. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. What did we cover? The first is the power of hype, that there are going to be people around you that are going to make promises. They're going to make promises about money, about sales, about growth, about a lot of stuff that isn't true in any way. What are you going to do? Nothing. There is nothing that we can do about it because the way we are wired is not to give into that hype. So. What we have to do is we have to understand, well, if we can't do that, what can we do? And that took us to the second part, which is how hype works with sales. So we see that hype does work with sales. When you promise these things, people are in that mood, that frame of mind, and they definitely want you to give them that hype almost. It sounds bizarre, but they almost want that result. They want to know that things will get dramatically better. They want that shortcut. And so they buy into that hype. But what we found is that, and we found this at Psychotactics, is that people are just as addicted to results. And when I say results, I don't mean results, I mean result. You get one result, and then the client comes back for another result, and the third result, and the fourth result. And they don't all have to be together. They could be together, but they don't have to be together. If you went to a workshop for three days, and you came back with this one magnificent skill of being able to draw, for instance, and you couldn't play badminton and you couldn't do Photoshop, it wouldn't matter. One result is enough.
And you see this with an ebook, for instance, the, the book that we give away when people sign up to our website. It just shows them how to look at headlines. And if you were to read Black Belt Presentations, the first book just shows you how to work with your slides, how to make them so great, so visually powerful. And then the second book does one thing again, and that is it makes you look at how you structure your presentation. So you can just promise one result at a time and deliver on that result, and then you don't need any hype. But what if the odds are stacked against you? Like all of these years, I've been trying to get this message across of talent, and it's been very hard for me to do that without doing this two-hour presentation. And what you do under these circumstances is you take those things that people believe to be true already and you say, well, so maybe you think that you can't do this. They say, yep, can't do that. You can't do this, can't do that, can't do this. So what if we were to work with just 10 minutes and you could get this result? So essentially what you're doing is you're saying, I am agreeing with the fact that you can't do A, B, and C, and we shouldn't be able to do D, but how about we give it a shot? And that's when clients come, okay, fine. You have agreed with A, B, and C, so let's try D. And that's how you use that kind of disinformation judo to your advantage. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. What's the one thing that you can do? To me, it's pretty clear what you can do. And I've been going on and on about this for quite a while now. And that is, you have to treat your product not as information, but as a result. I need to know when I get to the end of this paragraph or I get to the end of this page or I get to the end of this video, what can I do for sure? What is that result? You create that video, you create that book, you create that booklet, and the end needs to be clear. Just like reading a novel, just like watching a movie, if that ending is vague and fluffy, well, that doesn't work. So when I started playing badminton, it wasn't like my coach said, oh, you're going to be able to smash better than anybody else in this room. There was no hype. It was just that you're going to smash, you're going to learn how to smash so that you get far more points than you are getting right now. No hype involved. And that's what you can do. You can focus on the result. When you deliver the result, clients come back and then you don't have to go through this hype. You don't have to put up all these pop-ups and, you know, promise $50 million yachts and stuff like that. And let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics Land. On the 20th of June, we're opening up the Da Vinci course, which is the cartooning course. And you've heard me say this before, but... Being able to draw, being able to express yourself, being able to get to that point where you don't think that whatever you have is inborn, but something that you can learn. It's a skill, just like you learned walking or talking. Then that kind of course is for you because it empowers you in a way that you would not imagine. Now, that's on June the 20th. We start out with the 5000 BC list. So the members get first preference and then everybody else who's on the Da Vinci list. That's psychotactics.com slash Da Vinci, D-A-V-I-N-C-I. So if you want to be part of this whole cartooning experience, then this is for you. Now, I haven't mentioned this before, but we only have 20 seats this year, which means that if you haven't already gone to psychotactics.com slash Da Vinci, you should do so now so that you can prove your chances to get that notification to get on the course. And if you go back to the Psychotactics site, there are also other small products that are related to marketing. So you go to psychotactics.com slash tiny, T-I-Y, oh, sorry, psychotactics.com slash T-I-N-Y. And that's where you find all of the smaller products where you can improve your business. And, and sometimes it's the small things that make a huge difference. A client of ours wrote today saying how he sold a couple of extra courses, and all he did was change the testimonials. So he didn't change the content, he didn't change the sales page, 
but what he did was tweak the testimonials. And these are the kinds of things that you'll find in Tiny. So psychotactics.com slash tiny. And of course, this 5000 BC. Now, if you've wondered, I don't have a business, I don't have any idea what I'm doing, then nobody can help you, not us, not anyone on the internet. But there is a point where you start an idea and that idea gets discussed and then it gets tweaked and then it gets some pushback and then you come back. And that back and forth kind of thing is really what 5000 BC is to some extent. Now, if you already have a business, that's fine. Again, 5000 BC is fine. But there are lots of people who are on the fringes there who are thinking, what do I do? How do I go about it? This can only come through discussion and back and forth. It can't come like you just press a button and something happens. So check it out at 5000 BC. And if you just want to start with something tiny, then go to psychotactics.com slash tiny. And that's it from Psychotactics Land. I'll say bye for now. Bye-bye.